having gone through all the lectures by these eminent speakers, you must have realized that psychology has traveled a long distance. Uh, of course, cutting its umbilical cord from uh, philosophical influences and has uh, developed more and more uh, you know, uh, scientific temper. This very last lecture in a sense that the remaining two uh, that will be following it would be panel discussions. Uh, this very last lecture uh, is exclusively dedicated to technological advances, which were primarily to cater to the need in other domains of knowledge, but how psychology has been influenced by it and how those technology are being used in psychology. I must tell you that uh, all of you are aware uh, that uh, data analysis is something which is extremely, extremely dependent on the technological advances. Okay. There are uh, several softwares both for uh, qualitative as well as quantitative analysis and uh, data analysis is something uh, that you cannot get rid of in psychology. And therefore, you can understand how dominant the advances in technological domains have influenced psychology. But two interesting things, one that is uh, you know, the stimulus design has been influenced by uh, the advances that has taken place in uh, uh, technological domain and two the nature of conductance of experiment has also transformed, because there has been too much of advancements of uh, technology. I am uh, very, very uh, surgically making selection here and therefore, I am not at all going to talk about data analysis, I am not going to talk about conductance of experiment. Uh, primarily for two reasons. No, one that uh, most of you are aware of it uh, and uh, there is a uh, fatal danger that uh, uh, if I go into uh, looking at the technology that has been uh, very, very uh, helpful in terms of a stimulus design and conductance of experiment. Primarily, I would be uh, know indirectly uh, talking about a few selected uh, know, uh, softwares that I do not want to do here. And therefore, just I wanted to share with you uh, just uh, three visuals. Okay. Uh, this is a map of a campus primarily uh, and this has been designed by a non psychologist uh, colleague of mine. He is basically a designer who is looking into the making of isomorphic maps. Okay. I found it very interesting because uh, know, uh, right now uh, one of my student is also working on uh, spatial cognition. Okay. And therefore, if you look at the map, whether it is a 2 D map, whether it is a 3 D map, whether it is an isomorphic map, okay, uh, the angle from which you look at uh, the map or if you are having an aerial survey, the angle at which you are looking at uh, the space okay, starts influencing you. So, that is an interesting thing and I think that if you have to work on such topics in the laboratory, then it becomes extremely important uh, to look at uh, proper softwares or to modify the existing softwares, so as to cater to your need. Two, the student of mine, you know you can see on the screen right now, okay, that this is uh, using a particular software, where you have the possibility of dividing the space into grids and then in each of these grids you add certain things. You can see here most of the grids are unoccupied and few of the grids have certain images and then you can construct whatever you wish. It could be a city, it could be a geographical terrain, it could be a forest, it could be anything. And most importantly you would find here is that you can have a walk through. Okay. So, something that is otherwise impossible to think of okay, can very easily be uh, know, done in the laboratory setup. Okay, simply because you have uh, undergone or you have seen uh, the demonstrated capability of a technology. But in this very uh, uh, last lecture, my focus is exclusively on eye tracking technology and virtual reality. Why did I do this? As I told you that I do not want to indirectly endorse any of the softwares, uh, which supplements uh, know one or the other type of activities that psychologists look forward uh, to. But then, these are two cutting edge technology okay, 
and I can share with you to the uh, latest information that is available to me that eye tracking technology is available only at 8 centers in India as of now, okay, 2013 May I am talking about and of course, virtual reality which has not yet come to India. Okay. But then in uh, the western world you will see you no know, certain type of uh, research in psychology where virtual reality is being used in the laboratory setup. What I thought was uh, that I will introduce you to the eye tracking technology something that we have here uh, with us at IIT Kanpur. And then I will uh, know just make a survey of publications in the last 5 years that is 2009 to 2013 where eye tracking technology has been used. I have extensively done this job, uh, so as to uh, do justice to this fact that how uh, advancements in technology, which was actually to cater to some other need has been you know very well uh, used, it has been well adapted in psychology. Let me take you to the psychology lab of IIT Kanpur. You see the eye tracking machine here. And right now what you see is uh, the calibration being done, so that uh, the focus of uh, the participant can be recorded by the machine. And of course, uh, you can see here how uh, the individual's behavior is recorded by the eye tracking machine. And as you know, psychologist will always look for the numbers. Okay. Therefore, there are uh, methods of uh, quantifying this uh, gaze behavior and what you see on your screen now is the quantification of this gaze behavior, which has been uh, recorded using the eye tracker. Look at this uh, image on your screen now. Uh, this was uh, you know, uh, an experiment that I had performed couple of years back and I was interested showing you uh, that you can very easily plot the gaze movement okay, when one tries to identify a facial expression. It has multiple usage of course. Okay. So, right from uh, expression uh, to different types of uh, psychological disorders uh, to issues like deceit, foreign, uh, forensic applications. Okay. There are there are lot many things that has to do with it, but just look at this scan path of a happy expression. You now see scan path for sad expression. And now you see the scan path for fear as an expression on the face of the expressor. With this uh, brief introduction to how uh, eye tracker works, I basically come to the eye tracking technology and psychology. For this purpose, I have uh, you know, reviewed the publications that has come to uh, journals in the last 5 years. When I say last 5 years, this means 2009 to uh, April 2013. In 2013 till uh, now, when I am recording this talk, three papers have been published. One that has to do with uh, attention bias, second that has to do with attention and third one uh, which primarily deals with the neural, behavioral and the autonomic correlates of uh, facial processing. Okay. What I will do now is that one by one I will just briefly summarize uh, know what was done by the researcher in uh, this work that has been published and on the bottom you can see the full reference. If you are interested going into the details of it, you can of course, look at those papers. The first paper uh, that was published in 2013 is by uh, Sechner and his colleagues, which talks about attention bias towards threats and primarily what he looks at is the difference in the motor reaction time to threat and neutral cues. What he found was that anxious participants they display greater attention bias towards angry faces. You remember uh, the research in uh, emotion does say that anger is processed on priority. Evolutionary psychologists also talk about it, know that emotion uh, processing uh, when you look at uh, their uh, 
preferences and uh, of course, the sensory gating concept if you attach it to it, then you realize that uh, anger as an emotion is always processed uh, you know, in priority compared to rest of the emotions. Another interesting observation uh, in this study was that the uh, first and the faster fixation is always to the angry faces okay, and this shows the bias orientation towards the threat related stimuli. What is important to uh, note here is that this is actually consistent with the findings from earlier reaction time studies. Okay. So, before uh, know, uh, eye tracking technology was being used in psychology, there were studies like this, but with uh, the advent of uh, this new technology you realize that with precision you can actually uh, know, uh, convey the findings of your uh, study. One, two, when you say that this was processed on priority, you can calculate time in milliseconds and three, you can actually you know plot the trajectory of scan, okay, what is uh, referred to as scan path. The second study, uh, which was published this year was by uh, Taylor and Herbert. Okay. What they did was that they took six and nine month old infants and they asked them to watch uh, the video okay, of an adult. Uh, demonstrating uh, the sequence of actions with an object okay. and primarily they were trying to uh, examine was the role of attention during learning or recognition memory. What they found was that the age related changes in the focus of uh, infant attention during a learning event and of course, subsequent recognition memory for future events and at both ages that is 6 and 9 months attention was focused primarily on the object and person. Uh, I must tell you uh, that uh, earlier studies uh, know were also conducted uh, on how uh, facial expression of the caregiver, especially uh, father and the mother okay, and then of course, the other caregivers, how newborn babies or 6 month old baby, they scan uh, the facial expression of their parents and there are interesting studies on this. Okay. Uh, I have just uh, know uh, tried to show you this is not the exactly what was done by these researchers, but look at this animation which shows the eye movement of a uh, infant. Now, what you interestingly find here is uh, that eye tracking as a technology has been used, okay, ANOVA and T test as statistical uh, techniques have been used. Okay. So, conventionally and of course, the problem lies uh, uh, know what has been uh, usually the focus of attention by psychologists. So, problem uh, statistical technique everything remains the same, okay, but the new technology is being used. The third study uh, published this year was by uh, Wagner and his associates. Uh, they have studied you know, uh, autism spectrum disorder and they have uh, tried to find out uh, that these ASDs, uh, they have difficulty with social emotional cues okay. and then they have found uh, that the ASDs, they show a typical pattern of emotional facial processing one, two, they have reduced neural uh, differentiation between emotions and third, that reduction in the relationship between gaze behavior and neural processing of the face. What is very interesting to note here in this study was that you have intelligence test something which is very uh, well known to all psychologists. Intelligence test has been used. You also see that EEG has been used besides eye tracking technology and statistical technique analysis of variance has been used. Okay. So, that is an uh, know interesting uh, know mix of the existing uh, tools and techniques and the modern technology. Last year that is 2012, I found six papers were published in uh, scientific journals where eye tracking technology has been used. The constructs that have been studied are anxiety disorders, learning uh, and visual perception, attention bias, belief, long term working memory and social phobia. And the problems are also very interesting. First paper uh, talks about trait and state anxiety on attentional bias, 
Second paper talks of learning to segment a novel occluded objects in a scene. The third paper talks about existence of a specific information processing bias such as attentional bias. Uh, the fourth paper talks about uh, source evaluation. The next paper talks about influence of interruption, background speech and music on reading. And the last paper talks about the relationship between time course of attention and symptoms of social anxiety and depression. Okay. So, whole wide range of uh, you know, uh, topics have been taken into account. Now, in 2012, the first paper uh, that I am referring to here is uh, by Quingley and his associates, which talks about attention bias for threatening stimuli. Okay. And here, the relative influences of trait and state anxiety on attentional bias uh, pertaining to emotional images has been studied. Okay. Uh, what uh, Quingley and his associates found was that state anxiety was correlated with increased attention to threatening images, uh, regardless of the trait anxiety of the participant. And importantly, the duration of the initial gaze and the average fixation were always longer on threat stimuli compared to the neutral images. What you interestingly find here is that uh, personality has been uh, used as a construct you find anxiety disorder, which has been of again of prime importance and uh, significance to psychologists and attention to threat. All three constructs are older constructs, they have been thoroughly examined in uh, psychological literature. But then you find that these uh, constructs are revisited okay, uh, using the eye tracking technology. The second uh, paper that has been published uh, in 2012. Uh, that was by Emerson and Amzo. Okay. And what they did was that they uh, combined both the functional magnetic resonance imaging and eye tracking technique. And they used uh, it to examine the mechanism that is involved in learning to segment a novel occluded object in a scene. They were trying to understand the role of uh, effective visual sampling and prior experience in the development of mature object perception. Okay. Now, object perception, pattern recognition, these are no well researched areas in uh, psychology, but then you find two of the cutting edge technology being used by researcher. What did they find? Now, their neuroimaging data suggested an involvement of the hippocampus and the basal ganglia as well as the visual cortex and the frontoparietal regions of the brain. Okay. So, the psychological constructs you find learning visual perception, technology you find functional magnetic resonance imaging and eye tracking being used in this research. Okay. So, perfect combination by this time okay, the modern technology, uh, the existing constructs in psychology and the relevant problems. Third uh, paper that was published in 2012 was by Provencio and his associates who worked on a specific information processing bias such as attentional bias okay, that has to do with the persecutory belief. Okay. Now, people studying pathological behavior, people studying paranoia, okay, uh, they have been uh, know, using this construct since I do not know how long, okay, where uh, the whole idea of uh, persecutory belief has been uh, studied. In this case, okay, the activation of depressive cognitive schema okay, uh, was examined, because it is considered that they facilitate attention bias in those uh, who belong to the subclinical paranoia uh, domain. Okay. Now, this favors the depression based model of paranoia. Clinical studies on paranoia, clinical studies on depression and especially the subclinical uh, paranoia. Okay. Uh, you combine the cognitive processes in psychopathology, okay. but then using eye tracking technology what you succeed doing is that you are a trying to examine or revisit the etiological model of uh, paranoia or the persecutory belief. So, it is a fantastic combination of the recent technology that is being used to uh, know, revisit the oldest one of the oldest existing constructs in psychology in psychopathology okay and then also redefining psychopathology in terms of cognitive processes 
and also verifying the etiological model of uh, paranoia. The other paper that was published uh, last year that is in 2012 was by Kammerer and Vonnie, okay, and they were primarily interested finding out that how interface of search engines okay, and uh, the internet specific epistemic belief they influence the novices source evaluation in the web search process. What he did was basically he took uh, medical topics okay, and when uh, we search using one or the other search engines, okay, nowadays it is a very common practice. Okay, how do you trust uh, the what you call uh, the appropriateness of or uh, how do you consider that the information that is uh, given on a particular website is really valid information. Okay. So, they were trying to do this. So, it was basically the trust uh, factor it had to do with the web content, it had to do with the medical search process, but very interestingly it also has to do with user interface. And uh, those who are in uh, uh, design, those who are into psychology and design, uh, those who are into uh, user experience design and those who are into human computer interaction, okay, uh, they really uh, know admire uh, this very process of uh, learning the user's experience no, or what is called as the user interface. Now, what they found was that those who had a strong belief uh, that the web content uh, correctly uh, you know, showed the knowledge, okay, they were more focused you know, on the information selection okay, and they also realized uh, that the, it uh, has some betterment effect on the outcomes. Couchard and uh, his associates uh, you know, they published another paper in 2012. Uh, where they try to uh, find out the influence of interruption, background speech and music on reading. I remember my own days, uh, not only my uh, young student days, but even now at many occasions when I work on certain uh, thing, okay, I do play some light music in the background okay, and that basically you know, helps me. Uh, uh, get, rid, uh, get rid of this uh, monotony effect. It also reduces uh, the mental fatigue. This is a subjective experience. Now, here the researchers what they did was, they were trying to see if the interruptions, the background speech uh, and if the you play music in the background, what type of impact it has on reading. So, the participants were asked to read paragraphs while they were exposed either to background speech or to music or they were supposed to read the text in complete silence. What did they find? They found that interruptions increase reading time, very obvious. But what they also found was that the background speech slowed down the reading rate as compared to the reading in the presence of music or reading in silence. Okay. Now, this is actually congruent with the theory of long term working memory long term memory, long term working memory both have been you know of uh, interest to psychologists. In uh, the neuropsychological section you did hear uh, Professor Vivek Benigal talking about art and the brain and of course, the focus was uh, very little on uh, uh, music and the uh, processing of the brain and how other cognitive domains get uh, facilitated uh, when you have music in the background. But in this study you find uh, using eye tracking technology the researchers claim how background music can uh, know become a facilitator okay, of a psychological phenomena. Another paper that was published uh, last year that is 2012 was by Schofield and his associates. They studied social phobia okay, and they were trying to look at the bias uh, in the attention, okay, uh, whether they help in maintaining the symptoms of social phobia or not. Now, the characteristics of these biases include hyper vigilance to some uh, threatening cues, uh, difficulty in disengaging attention from threat and of course, the avoidance of the threat cues. What they found was uh, that social anxiety associated with attention to emotional faces okay, rather than the neutral ones. There was a difficulty disengaging from angry expressions. You remember uh, one of the papers we have right now discussed. No? 
where on priority angry expressions were uh, you know uh, analyzed and they also found a relationship between the heightened depressive symptom and the increased attention to the fear faces okay now uh, no this very work besides no adding to social phobia research okay it also no helps us understand the uh, no what you call experimentally testing the computing models that try to describe the phenomena of social phobia okay so that's another interesting way in 2011 uh, four papers were published and the primary constructs uh, that were uh, no examined in those papers were depression uh, perceptual motor processes problem solving and decision making in 2011 the first paper that i am referring to is by sears and his associates uh, who tried to examine attention and memory bias for emotional information in people uh, suffering from depression and dysphoria okay and they found that people who suffer from these two they also have poor memory now besides this very finding this experiment this very paper the findings of this very paper has implication for the cognitive model of uh, depression and they also talk about the vulnerability of depression franchak and his colleagues they an, uh, published another paper in 2011 where they talked about infants visual exploration during a uh, natural interaction so basically uh, when children they freely play with their mother how do they look at where they do they look at so gauge behavior during free play with the mothers very interestingly the findings were uh, that these children these infants they actually explore so their visual exploration has three interesting thing one opportunistic exploration two that they depend on the availability of information and three that they are limited by constraints of their own bodies okay so in terms of looking at infants perceptual motor behavior okay uh, and of course the visual gauge pattern okay this is an interesting study that way another interesting study uh, by moeller clean and nurk was on the multi digit addition task okay which talks about basically problem solving okay and of course they have taken reaction time as a measure uh, but here they talk about the multi digit addition and they are looking at the cognitive uh, instantaneation of the carry effect okay so when you have to add and you have a carry over no when you which you take uh, to the next one so how eye fixation behavior uh, works during the a verification of an addition problem okay and they found that there is a need uh, for a carry uh, that is actually recognized very early during the encoding of the problem itself okay so in terms of uh, understanding okay how one solves numerical problem in terms of understanding uh, how uh, one performs complex addition where one has to carry okay so numbers Uh, say two digit or more than two digit addition where you have a carry over effect okay it was uh, you know found that encoding actually is a stage where uh, you know uh, this thing uh, the need for carry over is uh, realized besides and uh, you know talking about problem solving and of course reaction time uh, what you interestingly find is also the application of techniques such as analysis of variance and uh, logistic regression in this study another study that was published in 2011 uh, was by flo and cotterell they were working on decision making process in simultaneous lineups okay so you have an array of faces uh, of a suspect okay and then uh, basically you have to uh, know find out uh, the suspect uh, who is along with uh, or whose face is uh, presented along with the foil faces okay now this besides you know being of importance for decision making this also has to this also has extreme forensic relevance okay because you identify a suspect a missed a set of neutral uh, people people who are not involved in the crime scene now they found that the lineup decisions can be uh, predicted by face dwell time and the number of visits made on the face now 
there are situations in uh, real uh, forensic examinations where either uh, no, uh, the police officer asks you to do that or you are asked to identify the person in the court of the law, where you have a suspect and you have others who resemble uh, to the individual, they are supposed to wear similar type of clothes and stuffs like this and then you are supposed to identify the suspect. Now, there are cases you know where uh, people uh, revert their decisions in the court of law, although they had said something else before the police officer in the court of law, they reverse their decision. Now, studies like this which actually tells you that how many times you visit the face of the suspect can actually you know uh, act as a predictor is an interesting finding from that point of view. Okay. Now, I come to 2010 and you find six papers where eye tracking technology has been used and the constructs primarily uh, studied were attention, memory, information processing in children and uh, perceptual processes. The first study that I am taking from 2010 is by uh, Clement and his associates who studied the effect of prior experience on the distribution of attention during judgment of analogical uh, similarity. Second paper that was published was by Sears and his colleagues uh, who worked on the bias in the allocation and disengagement of attention in diasporic individuals. What they found was that the diasporic individuals they spent significantly less time on positive images, it was one. They also found poorer memory for emotional images okay, and they found difference in the attention and the memory bias uh, that is seen in people who are depressed versus those who have dysphoria. Another study that was uh, published in 2010 worked on the perception of others feeding actions. Okay. So, when adults they feed infants, okay, how the babies they perceive the feeding action of those adults. So, once again the study has now focused on 6 month old infants okay. and what was found was that the, these infants can anticipate that food is being brought to their mouth okay, when they look at uh, the adults. Okay. But then they, it was found that they fail, these infants they fail to anticipate self propelled spoons that move towards the mouth. Okay. So, you need actually you know uh, an adult to move the spoon to the, the to the mouth of these infants to make them realize that they are actually going to be fed. Okay. Whereas, in the absence of an adult uh, figure they do not uh, realize so. They also found that uh, the 10 month old babies okay, and the adults they can very easily uh, you know anticipate the self uh, propelled spoons okay. and of course, adults can anticipate the combining actions also. Uh, but uh, this interesting study actually talks about information processing in children. Now, another study that was published in 2010 was once again on ASD, the autism spectrum disorder by Freet and his colleagues, okay, who talked about uh, priorities of attention to the region of the face that contains the eyes. Okay. Uh, you know that uh, ASD people they usually avoid uh, maintaining eye contacts. Okay. So, the time course analysis to uh, was uh, performed to understand the difference between normal control and those with autism spectrum disorder. And it was found that the ASDs were rapidly cued by the gaze direction and there was an immediate increase in total fixation duration at the location of the gaze. Okay. In 2010 another study was published by Roberts and his uh, associates. Uh, who worked on the encoding strategies used by primary school children okay. and once again they had used the free recall technique. So, this was basically assessment of free recall and recognition for target items okay. and they had measured resistance to interference by these primary school children. The findings of this study talks about the developmental changes between the ages of 7 to 10 years, no, especially in terms of ability to inhibit distraction and also to resist interference. Okay. So, primarily they talk about improvement in the capacity to strategically focus on task relevant aspects uh, in the case of primary school children. And uh, 
only one study that I found uh, published in the year 2009 was by uh, Richmond and Nelson, uh, who had uh, worked on memory. So, basically they had used eye tracking measures okay, and try to look at it, uh, look at it from the relational memory point of view. They had also worked on infants, the 9 month old infant, uh, they were uh, found to encode memories in terms of their relationship among the items. No? And this function actually is subsumed by the hippocampus. So, something uh, that is remarkable here is that you find that couple of these studies focusing on infants, that group of uh, human population which otherwise is very difficult to be uh, examined, that uh, it is very uh, difficult to make them uh, you know, participate in an experiment okay, and to precisely you know, come forward with a finding. You find that you know, eye tracking technology as an intervention has really helped psychology in a big way. What you also find is you know, that the clinical population has also been examined and of course, you know, several perceptual, motor and other psychological functions have also been examined. Now, it is time for me to uh, focus on how virtual reality as a technology has been uh, used in psychology. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we do not have the virtual reality facility uh, with us and to the best of my knowledge in this country as of now virtual reality facility is not available. But uh, what I will do is that I will uh, uh, try to show you uh, how actually uh, the stimulus looks like okay, if one uses uh, know the uh, head mount the visual uh, that is used in visual reality research. Look at this building. This is uh, the new core lab building of IIT Kanpur and uh, if I walk uh, you know, from the main entrance towards the corridors reaching the psychology lab, if you use the head mounted uh, virtual reality, this is how it would look like. Interestingly, in 2013, five papers have been published where virtual reality has been used as a technique. And here the constructs have been studied such as sexual deviation, such as counterintuitiveness, social skills, fibromyalgia and post traumatic stress disorder. Okay. The first study that I am quoting here uh, that, uh, that was published this year was by Renaud uh, and his associates, who examined the child molesters and sexually non-deviant uh, people. Now, sexual arousal and gauge behavior was assessed to characterize sexual preferences and intentional dynamics. Okay. So, you find here that gaze behavior which is actually an outcome of the eye tracking and virtual reality which is yet another technology is being used. And then what they found was that the analysis of average gauge radial uh, angular deviation can be uh, used to identify people who could be you know uh, molesters. Okay. So, once again uh, the findings of this study if they are validated by others also okay, could be of great help to the law enforcement agencies. And this also shows the use of virtual reality in probing the phenomenology of child molestation. So, both it has clinical application, it has uh, uh, forensic application. Another study that was published this year was by Hornbeck and uh, Barrett and uh, they actually examined the intuitive and counter intuitive test items. The free recall of display is no and how immediately and after uh, certain delays how these things work. Uh, basically, they were found a cross cultural support for Pascal Boyer's theory. The third study that was published this year was by Kandalaft and his associates who talked about the feasibility of an engaging virtual reality social cognition training uh, intervention, which was primarily focused on the enhancement of social skill, social cognition and social functioning. And here virtual reality platform uh, has been used as a promising tool that can improve all these three interestingly in autistic children. So, that is an interesting thing you find here high functioning autism group and you also find social interventions. 
Okay. Both of these things have been of prime interest to people in uh, clinical domain of psychology, but here you find virtual reality being used uh, to understand and explain certain phenomena. This year itself, the third paper that was published was by uh, Botella and his associates, who talks about the effectiveness of virtual reality as an uh, adjunct to cognitive behavior therapy. Now, cognitive behavior therapy is a well known uh, therapeutic technique to psychologists, but then virtual reality and CBT, this being uh, now put together is an interesting construct here. Now, the sessions of uh, group CBT uh, with adaptive virtual environment that contained a specific content for developing relaxation and mindfulness skill was uh, used here. The patients uh, were assessed at uh, pre-treatment, post-treatment and of course, after 6 months follow up okay, uh, with respect to pain, depression, negative and positive affect and coping skills. Okay. And what was found was that reduction in the pain and depression uh, was there and also there was an increase in the positive affect. So, Usually, you know this would look uh, very, very uh, interesting, very, very fascinating uh, to people working in uh, the clinical domain uh, to see how virtual reality can be used as a technology. Another study published this year itself is by Kramer and his associates, who talks about evidence based treatment uh, for PTSD. Okay. And remember the group that he has studied. Uh, is basically the military service personnels who participated in uh, operation Iraqi freedom. Here uh, virtual reality has been used as an aid uh, for intervention in the veteran health care system. Okay. Uh, so, how uh, psychological care, how mental health issues, how psychopathology and how virtual reality can be you know put together uh, under the same umbrella that is an interesting demonstration. Last year that is 2012, two papers were published where virtual reality has been used. One where uh, the heuristic tool for understanding and teaching uh, key concept in uh, psychology what that is transcendence that was uh, examined and the other paper where anxiety has been studied, which talks about association between explicit condition effect and subsequent avoidance behavior by human subjects. 2012, the first paper uh, that was published was by Gorendo and Groves, who talked about the use of an online virtual world that is second life, most of you must be aware of it. How that can be used as a heuristic tool to make uh, people understand the key concept of psychoanalysis that is transference. Okay. So, that is an interesting thing, how virtual reality can be used for that. The other paper was by Glotzbast and his uh, associates, who talks about the maintenance of anxiety disorder. Okay. Uh, primarily, it is uh, know, talking about conditioning. So, fear conditioning, how it leads to avoidance. And uh, using virtual reality, they found association between explicit uh, conditioning effect and subsequent avoidance behavior. Okay. Uh, remember, the best part of virtual reality is that you do not uh, know interact in real life with that situation. Okay. It is all in the lab setup in a very, very uh, controlled and safe environment, but that can be you know uh, give an impression to the participant as if one is really experiencing it. 2011, there were uh, 5 papers, 2 uh, dealing with post traumatic stress disorder, 1 dealing with stroke, 1 dealing with Parkinson's disease and 1 dealing with the traumatic brain injury. Ma and associates, they uh, worked on the kinematics uh, of the Parkinson's diseased patients. And they were uh, you know, trying to understand the practicing uh, effect of uh, reach in the virtually moving target. So, you have a virtually moving target and people with Parkinson's disease who will have lots of difficulty moving their uh, arm, okay. uh, how they try to reach the target. And they found uh, that using virtual reality. Okay, they can study uh, what would improve uh, uh, motor performance in people who suffer from Parkinson's disease. Now, reaching for faster moving virtual balls with the dominant hand that was the task here and what was observed was that the success rate and the kinematic data for acceleration phase 
okay, all movement time, peak velocity and percentage of movement time okay, with the pre and the post test data okay, uh, show that yes there is an immediate transfer effect. Okay. So, fantastic uh, research uh, on Parkinson's uh, diseased uh, patients okay, where you use uh, virtual reality for neuro rehabilitation. Another study published in 2011 was by Galvin and uh, his colleagues, uh, where uh, stroke patients were examined. And this very study actually looked at virtual reality systems for rehabilitation of upper limb skills of children who had neurological uh, impairments. Once again, you find virtual reality neuro rehabilitation okay, for the stroke patients. PTSD, of course, no, uh, right now we discussed one paper. Uh, another paper is by Maclay and Associates, who worked on soldiers who were posted in Iraq and Afghanistan okay, and they were working on the treatment of the PTSD. What they found was that the virtual reality graded exposure therapy okay, and uh, the usual treatment uh, know, that is the tau for PTSD, okay, uh, how you know, combat related uh, uh, stress and PTSD can be handled using post traumatic stress disorder. So, great clinical application of the virtual reality uh, technology. Traumatic brain injury uh, pa patients were also studied by uh, Larson and his associates. This paper was published in 2011, where a three dimensional cancellation exercise. Okay. Now, cancellation test is something that is known to all psychologists, but a three dimensional cancellation exercise over two days in an interactive virtual environment was the demand in this case. Okay, with minimal distraction okay. and this study uh, also looked at the integration of the visual and the tactile stimuli. Okay. Once again, the findings have great relevance for neuro rehabilitation. What they found was that there was there is an attention exercise using virtual environment that can be done and of course, you know, it is very, very beneficial for the inpatients who come with the traumatic brain injury. Rager and his colleagues uh, know, published another paper in 2011, where once again the exposure therapy uh, in uh, PTSD treatment was being uh, examined here. And uh, know, there are of course, very limited research that evaluates the effectiveness know, in the active duty service members. So, this very therapy, the VRE, the virtual reality exposure therapy in the active duty soldiers were, uh, was done. And once again, know the soldiers who were posted in Iraq and Afghanistan, okay, they were the participants of this very study. So, uh, the healthcare system, uh, both in the civil and the defense sector, both have uh, no benefit of the usage of virtual reality in psychology. In 2010, three papers were published using virtual reality technology, uh, one working on the high level social phenomena, second on dissociation and the third one on PTSD. Now, Kozlov uh, and Jonasson, they worked on the simple video game based virtual environment okay, and uh, they were trying to look at uh, psychological uh, research on the real world behavior okay, and the likelihood of helping uh, others when you have your own time pressure and when you have the bystanders. What type of likelihood it has? Uh, no, on your helping behavior okay, that was uh, being examined here. Okay. So, that is another interesting study. Another study published in 2010 was by Ardema and Associates, which was on the effect of virtual reality on dissociative experience and the sense of presence. Okay. And here both no, depersonalization and derealization, both of these dissociative experiences were examined. In 2010, another study uh, that came forward studied the PTSD in a 30 year old soldier. Okay. And here the military contingent you know, who had gone to Iraq and had a very narrow escape uh, to death. This soldier was specifically chosen for the study, because thrice during his posting in Iraq, he narrowly escaped death. And here once again. Uh, virtual reality was used uh, to examine combat stressor and uh, no, this was supplemented with uh, behavioral training that consisted of uh, desensitization, aversive reaction, okay, uh, all types of things, no contact with weapons in the shooting range and uh, so forth. And 
a beautiful uh, way of uh, you know looking after the mental health of uh, individual soldiers okay, who have experienced uh, you know, such type of situations in their profession. If you look at the importance of uh, these two technology in psychology, right now what we saw was eye tracking being used for anxiety, attention, autism spectrum disorder, uh, visual perception, belief, working memory, social phobia, depression, problem solving, decision making, perceptual motor processes, virtual reality being once again used for PTSD, anxiety, Parkinson's disease, dissociation, traumatic brain injury of course, uh, sexual deviation uh, and social skills. You find a great degree of uh, you know, uh, significance of these two technologies uh, on uh, this examination of human behavior. This was actually an attempt to uh, take you uh, right from uh, the first lecture, where I talked to you about how psychology emerged as a discipline. Okay. So, right from looking at the philosophical influence uh, on uh, psychology, uh, to psychology becoming a science of behavior, the whole uh, process of uh, systematic and scientific study, exploration, examination of human behavior, to the last lecture, where we have come to the cutting edge technology being used in psychology. So, with this, uh, you know, we complete uh, this whole discussion on the wide range of topics pertaining to uh, psychology and this is the last lecture of uh, this very course, what is named as selected topics in psychology.